Very good. Okay, well, actually, I, I, I'm feeling, um, I'm, I feel a little nervous. I haven't preached now for, this is the longest I've gone without preaching since starting Cornerstone in 2010. I went four Sundays in a row without preaching, and I was feeling your pain, your, your, no, okay, all right. <laughs> well, <clears throat> as it turns out, all the guest preachers were quite good, uh, so I'm hoping to up my game. You can let me know how I did, uh, but I, I, yes, yeah, I'm grateful for the long break, and um, especially with the movie and everything, it was it was very nice to not have to worry about it. But I'm eager to get back into the uh, into the ring again, as it were. Is there a little bit of ring on this, or is is the volume okay? That's what I thought. Maybe there's some reverb on it. Let me just see if I can fix that. Maybe it's just too too loud. Is that a little better? That's a little better. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So we were in the midst of, and we're going to return to Abraham. So we're going to be in Genesis 18, if you want to follow along. I've got the scriptures up here, though, if, uh, it, just so you can read along. Um, well, let's, let's, let's go ahead and jump right in. So we'll read the first, the couple of scriptures here. Genesis 18, this is the story of the Lord appearing um, to Abraham with two angels as well. And um, yeah, we'll go ahead and start. So Genesis 18, chapter 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. In the area of Mamre, you'll remember there were these great oak trees. It was one of Abraham's favorite places to be, where he first built an altar, and there were these huge trees that provided uh, shade. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. We'll stop there. So on this faith journey with Abraham, we've seen him evolve, to use the term, from really a rather typical kind of standard tribal chieftain warlord of his time, with all the weaknesses and sins uh, that, that you would expect uh, from a man like that. Uh, not what we would consider in contemporary terms a good man by any objective uh, term, but he is the one that the Lord has chosen. Now, Abraham's actions are still imperfect, as we have seen in recent chapters. His thoughts are often in conflict with God's will. I'm sure we can relate. But he has learned that the Lord is blessing him and that it is a true experience that he's having and that the Lord is trustworthy as well, that when he makes promises, they come true and he's being protected by the hand of the Lord. These are things that Abraham is learning. And one of the fun things, one of the things I really enjoy about studying Abraham, it's, you know, he's, he's really starting off as a man who knows nothing about God and he learns step by step, uh, brick by brick about who God is. And for me, I, this is part of how I relate to Abraham. Uh, because I was one of the ones who was not raised in the church. And not only was I not raised in the church, but I, was, I, was, I had no education of God in, in any sense or who Christ was or anything about it. And so I, I relate to Abraham's kind of shock and awe, to use that term, probably a terrible term, but his shock anyway, about who God is. Um, I can relate to that. Some of you who are raised in the church probably don't quite have the same experience, so you have different ones. But this I can relate to. So there's a lot of things that Abraham still clearly does not know about the Lord at this point. A lot of things he does not understand. Indeed, there are a lot of things that we still now do not understand. Um, his faith has grown, but he does lack knowledge about God and God's purposes and who God is. One thing he does not yet understand, and that's what this story addresses, this is what this experience with the Lord addresses, is how intimate God's intentions are with us in relation to him how intimate God's intentions are with us in relation to him. That's one thing Abraham does not yet understand. He understands worship. He understands trust, or he's learning to. But he doesn't understand the, the intimate plans that God has for Abraham and indeed all of humanity, us. In other words, our God is not a God who we worship at a distance, that God is over there or be beyond a veil and we worship, uh, and you know, we don't draw near into the holy land. You know, no, quite the opposite, right? Emmanuel, God with us. In fact, I think David just mentioned Emmanuel 
and we're entering into the season of Advent, we're going to hear that phrase a lot more. And that's indicative of the intimate relationship God wants with each one. He wants to be Emmanuel, God with us. And Abraham has not yet really understood that. So here we begin to see the beginning of the friendship, if you will, between God and Abraham, the intimacy that's coming. Now, relationships have a lot of traits in common. So we're, I'm just going to go over a couple of these. Uh, it's like teaching kindergarten now, and I apologize for that. I'm not talking down to you. I'm trying to get into the very the ground root of our faith in God, if, if you will. So in a relationship, and you learn this in kindergarten or ought to, um, there's reciprocity, which is to say, in a, in a good friendship, if I have a good friend, I, that uh, he would expect me to do things for him, and uh, I would expect him to do things for me, there'd be some reciprocity. Now, we're not keeping track of the things we do for each other. We don't have a list, at least not in a healthy friendship, of, oh, you've, you've, gone, you've done too much for me this week, I've got to do more for you. And so, you know, you don't do that in a friendship. Laura and I sometimes are guilty of keeping a list. And we start, actually, lately, we felt very guilty because a lot of people have been helping us move. And so we feel like we're, you know, in the red and we need to, to, to do a lot of things for people. But that's not normal or healthy. In fact, Cheryl sometimes calls us to truth in this. And she calls that, and I quote, stupid, uh, to, to keep lists. And she's very helpful in, in um, keeping us honest in this regard. But th this is a standard experience of relationships, of, to, to expect that sort of reciprocity. Now, I know, at least if you're following along with me, and I hope some of you are, I know that God does not need anything from us. I take that as just a core truth as a Christian, as a follower of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. He made the very lungs that are breathing out these words right now. He crafted my soul. The notion that God would need something from me, of course, is foolish. And I think if you reflect even for a moment on that, I know that. So it's not, perhaps friendship with God is not similar in that way as to friendships with each other, where we really do sometimes need each other. God does not need us. It is God's graciousness. It is God's love. It is his grace that he has created a world, a universe, where we can bless God, where we can give something to God, and it matters to him. We may not need it, but it, he, he loves it, and he loves being in a relationship with us, and he gives us the means to give to him to bless God. That's an incredible thought. It, it may fall off our lips somewhat easily, but it's an incredible thought that you can bless the creator of the universe and do well by him, for lack of a better phrase. That's, that is something I have a hard time wrapping my mind around, and maybe that's why sometimes we don't think of it very often. We can provide something to God. He gives us a way to return something to him. Why does God want blessings from you? Why does God want anything from you? Because it's reciprocity, right? It creates this intimacy that God wants. Uh, John chapter 15, you don't have to turn to it. It's not up here, just listen. Um, in John chapter 15, Jesus in his uh, last uh, sermon, if you will, to his disciples before the crucifixion, he says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's what Jesus gives us, right? Greater love has known, I'm going to lay down my life for you, and I call you my friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. That's the reciprocity. That's, so I'm going to do this for you, my friends. I will lay down my life. Now do what I command. What did he command? My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. That sentence actually works like a loop. <laughs> you can read it over and over again. Love each other as I have loved you. And that does take, if I can borrow from David's sermon last week, that takes intentionality. It takes interruptibility. I've forgotten the third eye, but it takes two of them. <laughs> Intimacy. Well, that's what the whole sermon's about. That's why I forgot it. It takes those things. So Abraham. Now, so back to this. Abraham recognizes the Lord. We don't know how or why or just a, something in his heart he knows, but he recognizes that the Lord is... It has, is standing in front of his tent with these two angels. We find out later the other two are angels. Um, I won't get into that right now. But the Lord is there. And Abraham wants to give the Lord shelter and food and companionship. Well, it's the heat of the day. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever traveled to desert climates, uh, 
But if you're walking in the, yes, I <laughs> some of you live there, you're walking in the heat of the day, you know, in the afternoon of those climates, that's not just uncomfortable, it's borderline dangerous. It can be dangerous. This is a time before gas stations and holiday ends. I mean, you, hospitality was a life-saving thing back then. It was much more important than it is now, at least in North America, in our culture. And so he sees uh, these men, and he recognizes one as the Lord whom he worships, and he says, I can help. Come, come and, sh and, and let me show you hospitality. And at the same time, he still wants to show deference. It says here, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them, and he bowed low to the ground. He's showing worship and deference and saying, I can help. Now, you might say, what a privilege it is to have the Lord show up, and it is, in, in a recognizable way that this is the Lord showed up at your house in need of a meal and some rest. Not literally in need of a meal and some rest. Like I said, God doesn't need anything from us, but that the Lord would create a situation whereby you can serve him, right? I mean, that is, that's a privileged moment to say, Lord, I will come in and take care of you, that the, that the Lord would, would allow us that kind of intimacy with him. It's unique. It's unprecedented so far in the Bible. And of course, as Christians, you know, in reality, this is an opportunity we have, if not every day, this is an opportunity we have regularly on this earth. While there is breath in our lungs, we have this very opportunity to serve God. Um, Matthew uh, 25, in the, the parable of the sheep and the goats, this isn't up here either. I'll just read and you can listen. Lord, this is the righteous, the saved speaking to Jesus. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? They're saying, I don't even recognize you. I don't know who you are. When, when, when do you say that we did these things? And the king replies, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And I'm sure you, if you've been alive as a Christian for any amount of time, you've heard that before. And it goes all the way back to Abraham, providing for the Lord out of his out of what the Lord has given him, out of Abraham's abundance, what he's been blessed with, he is providing for the Lord and every bit as much as this parable of the sheep and the goats indicates. This is our privilege too. This is our birthright as disciples of Christ, if you will, to be able to serve the Lord in this way. Now, I don't want to go too far down this road. I just want to put a pin in it just to mark it. The people in the sheep and the goats parable are not saved because of, of their good works, if you will, because they did enough good things that canceled out their sin and boom, they're done. That's not what saves them. They're saved because of their friendship with God. That's what the king says. I never knew you, or alternatively, I knew you. It's the, it's the relationship. It's the intimacy. It's not the works themselves. And to go back to the model of a friendship, say, between Jim and myself or whomever, you know, it's not the things we do for each other that create the friendship. I suppose in, in theory, you could do things for someone you really dislike and hate you know, for whatever reasons, you know, but it's the fact that Jim recognizes me and appreciates me for who I am, for Seth, for the, the good parts of me, the way that God has made me. And, and so Jim, so we have a friendship and I appreciate Jim for who God has made him and just love him for being who he is, who God made him. It's not the things we do for each other. And this is that knowledge when Jesus says, I never knew you or I knew you. That's the point of salvation or the point of non-salvation. Are you friends with God? Are you in a relationship with God? Are you allow, allowing God to be intimate with you in this way? So Abraham is experiencing uh, Matthew 25, this parable, in a, in a very real and concrete way. He sees strangers. He recognizes that one of them is the Lord. He invites him in and serves him. Now. How do we serve the Lord? Okay, here we go. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. So he's, he's offered his hospitality to these, these, these three men. Quick, he said, get three sias of the finest flour. And I read that that's apparently 36 pounds. So he's making, making a meal here. Um, knead it and bake some bread. 
Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare. Of course, this is before refrigeration. So if you want fresh food, that's how you make fresh food. Kevin will be doing that soon, actually, if it, as soon as his cows come in. Um, I lost my place. Uh, he then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Okay, now let's talk about blessing the Lord and serving the Lord. Just generally speaking, not even just with the least among these, the poor, but just generally speaking, how, how to serve the Lord in a church, in a community. First, you can't do it yourself. You can't do it all yourself. This is the pastor's version of the good news. <laughs> you really can't do it yourself. We all need each other. Abraham, of course, cannot make this kind of a meal all on his own. It's questionable at this time and place with the division uh, of gender roles being as severe as they were. It's questionable whether Abraham even knows how to bake bread. Maybe he does. I don't know. I'm not going to go down there, but, you know, he, he goes and he finds the people who are gifted to do the things that need doing. And he's the one who puts it all into motion. Abraham, he's the one who's offered hospitality. He's the one who's organizing all this, but he can't do it by himself. So he says, hey, this is happening now. The Lord is here now. We need to react. We need to do something about it. And th this is a constant um, drumbeat of our life together as a church. And sometimes it comes from uh, the pastor. Sometimes it comes from the deacons. Quite often it just comes from people in the church who say, I think the Lord is doing something now. We need to, to do this. We need to get on this. And then we all gather together. And, say, okay, and the most recent example, of course, is when uh, the Lord gave Ray a, a word about you know, how to do this. And we we're like, okay, this sounds great. And we're all, you know, so this is the way this works. And if, you, if we try to do it all of ourselves, then we're in trouble. Now, there's a second point here with regard to serving the Lord and blessing others that you might miss, uh, but I didn't miss it <laughs> because it also um, hit me. So Abraham goes and he gets the, the people to help to do what he needs doing. But then ordinarily, you would have servants, a man like Abraham who has hundreds of servants, literally, you would have servants serve your guests and you would be sitting down with your guests as the patriarch, as the tribal chief leader, you would be sitting with the other three men and you would be served uh, with, by your servants as well at the meal. Does that make sense? That's not what Abraham does. He actually is the servant. He's the waiter. He's the one who brings the food to them. And then he doesn't even sit down, which shows his attitude of a servant. He stands nearby waiting for, if they, you know, just like a waiter would, if they need anything, if they need a glass of water or a cappuccino or whatever passes for a cappuccino back then, you know, he's there waiting. And that's a sign of respect and a sign that he is a servant to them just as much as the people who prepared, the servant who prepared the food or his wife, Sarah, or anything. You can imagine if you're at a restaurant and the waiter comes up to you and sits down in the booth with you. It's like, well, what can I get for you today? You know, why are you? You're the servant, Stan, you know, I, I've never had that happen, but it would be kind of funny. Um, so he's, he's acting as a servant. Every leader in the church, whether it's the pastor or the deacons or the elders or whatever church uh, model they have, if that leader is not willing to be a servant, that is a church that is in deep danger. Uh, if that pastor says, um, what, clean the toilets, which I have done <laughs> several times. And that's so. I'm not. Bo that's not a boast. That's you shouldn't have the mind set any of us that there's something that we won't do because it's beneath us in the church or for the church. That is where things start to get. Then, then Christ is no longer. You know, then the entire uh, image of Christ washing his disciples' feet and saying, you know, go and do likewise. This, this is the model I've given you. You're just throwing that out. You're just throwing that out. There's, we are all now pastors and deacons and elders, they have a certain, or they have a role to play, they have a certain authority, whatever. There's certain roles that we're all called to do, but no one is better than anyone else. And no one has that kind of standing except the Lord himself. We're all servants before the Lord. And that's something that uh, no matter what church you go to or where you worship at, if you get the sense it's not that way, then I advise thinking about whether a different church might be a, a good idea my two cents. Um, and I, I'm blessed because the pastors I became a Christian under, uh, some of you know the church, uh, were truly servants. They didn't have a sense that anything was beneath them. They, and they modeled that. And I 
I'm really grateful for that because that would have set off a lot of alarms for me. Abraham understands this. He's a servant too. He will serve the Lord. So we hear the call. We respond as a community. Everybody is a servant. And then, where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. And this is a really, we'll end with this. This is an interesting little vignette here. There in the tent, he said, and the tent's nearby, as becomes clear. And then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening, because Sarah's no fool, <laughs> listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing, so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out, my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And Sarah was afraid, and so she lied and said, I, I didn't laugh, it wasn't me. And the Lord said, yeah, you did. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it said. Now, there's so many things here. I, I love this little story. But to draw some larger conclusions out from the beginning, and I think this is obvious to all of us, God's timing is not our timing, right? God's timing is not, this is the worst possible timing for, for Sarah to have a child. This is not what they wanted. It's not how they wanted it, I should say, but this is in the Lord's timing. It's not convenient. And that's why being interruptible, that's why being interruptible, as David preached last Sunday, I can, I'm starting to hear my beard scratching. I need to trim my beard. <laughs> um, that's why being interruptible is so important, right? To be a follower of the Lord means being interruptible. God has to be able to stop you in your schedule and say, this is what we're doing now. And you're allowed to say, I think that's a terrible idea. That's fine. You can say it to God. Take a psalmist view. That's fine. But you know what? You're going to miss out on some blessings if you don't follow down that road. So being interruptible is important. And Sarah's laughing because she doesn't think this interruptibility is even possible or even necessarily a great idea. Now, the other thing to take out of this is that when you bless the Lord, when you invite God in, as they did, literally invited him into their, their campfire, into their, uh, their, their area, and, and served him, that the blessing God gives you in return is much greater than the blessing you gave him. So in our worship, and whatever it is, in our worship, our tithes, uh, the time we spend serving, whatever it is, whatever blessing that you are blessing God with, it's going to pale in comparison to what God gives you. Abraham gives God a meal and a place to stay, basically, and some companionship. And God says, you're going to have a son by this time next year. These are not comparable gifts. These are not, you know, one is about, you know, you know $20.99 of Biagi's, and the other is a lifetime of blessing. So it, it's, a, you know, and it is... You know, I don't want to wander into the health and wealth uh, idolatry thing of like, well, if you bless, then you get this back. It's not, a, it's not Wall Street. God isn't, and I think most of you are mature enough to know that. You don't get back, I gave God $100, so I'm looking for my $1,000 back next month. doesn't work like that. But I do believe if you give cheerfully, and I'm not just talking about your money, I mean your time, your heart, your soul. When you give cheerfully and readily, that you are blessed in turn. I certainly have been. Now, there's a way to think about my life. There's a way to think about what I've get. I could add up. So I've been tithing since I was, uh, whenever I was convicted of tithing, which I think was around 18, 19 years old, shortly after I became a Christian. And uh, I could add up all the money that I've been tithing, which actually starts off pretty small. 10% <laughs> of almost nothing is close to almost nothing. Um, add up all those dollars and say, I could look at this and say, this is all the money I would have. Think of what I could do with this money if I wasn't giving it to the Lord. I could do that. And I maybe it's possible, who knows? But if I hadn't become a Christian, if I wasn't dead, that's a whole other story. If I lived and I hadn't become a Christian and I lived my life out of my own desires, out of my own heart, maybe I would have lived my life in such a way that I would be a really wealthy man right now, wealthier than I am anyway. Maybe that's true. So <laughs> I, mean, I am so blessed to walk with the Lord. I have such a life of love and community and faithfulness. I'm blessed to even know what holiness is. Even if I don't achieve it, 
I'm blessed just to know what it is and, and to search after it. How, how, do you, how do you rate that kind of a blessing? You can't. So God, anyway, my point is that he will always outbless us when we invite him into our life and bless him. That doesn't mean we're not blessing him. We are. We, you know, he, he loves the praises of his people. He loves the, the, you know, the, the scent of our sacrifices as it talks about in the Old Testament that come up from the altar. He loves our praises. And when we sacrifice, when we're like Christ, and we say, I want this, but because of the Lord, I'm going to do this, which looks harder, but I'm going to do it because I'm faithful to you, Lord. I think he loves that, even as we love it when we see it in our children. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. God's timing is not our timing, and he will outbless us in turn. Now, what's interesting about this on, on a human level, I'll wrap up with this. On a human level between Abraham and Sarah, there, first of all, there's always some tension right up to the very end of the story of Abraham and Sarah. There's some tension between them. Um, Abraham, of course, treats her very poorly near the beginning of the story. There's stuff coming up too. But, you know, and Sarah, of course, as we know, just learned in the last chapter, has her own will and her own strength, and it is strong. And she can be, uh, you know, like you look at how she treated Hagar. She's not always, she, ha she has her own sins. And they're both, they both grew up in a culture steeped with power and violence in a way that, that maybe we did not. But so there's always some tension between them. But this question that they ask him, where is she, indicates that she ought to be there. It's sort of, a, it's almost, it's a little passive aggressive. I hate to con <laughs> accuse the Lord of passive aggressiveness, but he can be, right? When he walks to the garden, he says, where are you? He knows exactly where Adam and Eve are. You know, that's a little passive aggressive. He's looking to get answers out of us. It's, it's us that he's trying to get answers out of. He knows the answers. So he says, where is your wife, Sarah? And he says, she's in the tent. And, you know, it's the tents nearby. And he doesn't call her out. He doesn't say Sarah come out or anything like that. Presumably she stays there. And one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Notice he doesn't say, Abraham, you will have a son. He says, Sarah, your wife will have a son. He's talking to, he knows Sarah can hear him, I assume. And he's saying, Sarah, you're going to have a son. And Sarah's reaction is at best mixed. Uh, now, for those of you who have had children, uh, you're going to, and if you haven't, uh, you're going to understand this if you have friends who've had children who were colicky and didn't sleep through the night. Um, that's an exhausting thought. <laughs> and I'm not so sure when she says, she laughs, she says, after I'm worn out, my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Yeah, is that sarcastic? It's not, actually, I, I, read, but I read several exegetes comments on this, and I, there's a variety of opinions. Short answer, it's hard to say. It could be sarcasm. It could just be like, oh, great. Or it could be, I mean, she has wanted her own son her whole life. So maybe she's you know, maybe she laughs because she thinks it's not possible, but she's like, you know, could it be? I mean, it's hard to say if there's a note of hope in there or if it's just sarcasm. Sarcasm is a real thing in the Bible, by the way, and so it's, it's not unheard of that that would be sarcasm. Who knows? But anyway, she, she has some disbelief about it. That seems very clear. And the Lord says to Abraham, not to Sarah, but to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child now that I'm old. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Oh, so this is, it's an interesting way that he's phrasing this, and I'm going to read to you why, why the Lord is saying this to Abraham. And in the previous chapter, just a few paragraphs before Genesis 17, when the Lord tells Abraham he's going to have a son, Jim, can you go in the nursery and, and have a look there? Thanks. Um, when the Lord says to Abraham that you're going to have a son, Abraham, uh, chapter 17, verse 17, Abraham fell face down in worship. No, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man of 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. So who laughed first? Not Sarah. So when God says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child? What's he reminding Abraham of? You did it first. Abraham knows full well why Sarah laughed 
because he laughed first. And so he's doing, you can see he's, he's almost drawing them together as a couple and saying, you know, you're, you're cut from the same cloth of disbelief. You just got a bit of a head start here. Sarah's just catching up now and she's laughing just as you did. And then the story ends, Sarah was afraid. And of course, when we humans get afraid, we tend to lie. That's uh, just, when we get fearful, we lie. It's just a, it's almost instinctual. So she, she tries to cover herself and say, ah, oh, I didn't laugh. And God says, no, you did. And so I think there's, a, there's almost a attempt of like kind of healing here between Abraham and Sarah. I don't wanna make too much of it, but somehow he's tying them together and also letting us know through the story that you really can't hide things from God. You know, Adam and Eve can't hide in the garden. Abraham's laughter is not forgotten by God just because it happened, whatever it was, a few months ago. And Sarah can't lie to God, even as we can't lie to God. So that, that's the, the story of, of, of the visitors. And um, next week, we're going to get into Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're going to, and I know that's going to be a tough one. We're going to have two Sundays on that, the beginning, and, or the beginning, middle, and then the end. Uh, beginning, middle, and the first one, and the end, the second one. Um, next Sunday should be fine. Uh, the next the Sunday after that gets into some pretty heavy stuff, and so we'll be talking to the children about where they want to be or whatever, because it's it's uh, some hard things to talk about. And this is my version of a trigger warning too, because uh, if you know that story, you know some really dark things happen. We're going to talk about them, and so see you then. <laughs> uh, but I did want to end just by saying, if you are if you are in a relationship with the Lord. And this talk about this, um, uh, this intimacy with God, this relationship with God, this friendship with God feels hollow to you, or it feels false, or something that a preacher is likely to say from a pulpit, but is not an experience of yours. I, you know, I, I just recommend that you pray about it, or pray it with brothers and sisters who are here, or you know, call me this week, text me or whatever, and think about that, because I, do, I think it is possible uh, to go your life and to gradually... Um, pull away from intimacy with God and move into a kind of a legalistic place with him where you didn't intend for that to happen and you didn't want for that to happen, but maybe because of something you believe about God that is false, or maybe often because of a hurt that you've experienced and that has pushed your trust from God away or destroyed your trust with God. And so your relationship with God is very legalistic and very much about, well, I believe in the cross. I believe in uh, forgiveness and I'm saved. And that stops there. But the question is, does God know you? Do you have a friendship with God? I know that can be an intimidating thing sometimes, but I, I just want to open that up to discussion, for, not right now, but in the future. If you want to talk and pray about that, or if that kind of digs at your heart a bit, uh, I'm available for that discussion, or a brother or sister is a good discussion to have with someone you trust, someone you're friends with. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I pray that we would have the heart of Abraham, that when we see you on the road, hot and dusty and in need, that as followers of you, the response in our heart would be, how can I help? How can I be of assistance? How can I provide what is needed? Whether what is needed is spiritual, whether it's emotional or practical, Lord, I pray that we would be a people who are known to be followers of you because of the love that we bear for each other first, for our neighbor second, and most dramatically uh, for those who might call themselves our enemies. Lord, I, I pray that we would be servants. I pray that we would be united in heart, mind, and spirit as your body, and that we would reach out and minister to those who are far from you, and that you would be glorified through that. Lord, I pray that this worship service would be a blessing to you, that you would derive joy and fullness from it. And Lord, I thank you in advance for the blessing you will give us through our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Now's our time of communion. And if you're in a relationship with Jesus, we invite you to the communion table. It's his table, not ours. It's in the, in the back there. And the musicians will continue in worship as we go.